You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of The Corbett Report. I'm your host, as always, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you from the sunny climes of Western Japan here on the 7th day of November, 2014. This is episode 297 of The Corbett Report podcast, China and the New World Order. And yes, if you are just tuning in from the last edition of the Questions for Corbett series, of course, we did leave it up to the Corbett Report community to decide what episode 297 would be about, either about the plane crash of Total CEO De Marjorie or China's position in the New World Order. The Corbett Report community has responded overwhelmingly for the China episode, and I'm glad they did, because this is a topic that I've been researching in one form or another for a few years now in earnest for the last few months and uh, in absolute incredible detail in the past two weeks. And I have a doozy of an episode for you today. If you think this podcast has been informative or data packed in the past, you ain't seen nothing yet. So let's roll up our sleeves and get to work on constructing today's narrative. And it starts in a position that I think most of us will be familiar with. If you are even glancingly looking at the headlines this day and age, you will note that there is an undeniable, a demonstrable buildup of diplomatic, financial, and military tensions between the NATO powers on one side and China and its allies on the other. Now, new warnings over cybersecurity and the growing cyber war between the U.S. and China. U.S. officials charging members of a shadowy unit in the Chinese military, accusing its agents of stealing trade secrets from American companies. And the Chinese government has hit back. They summoned the U.S. ambassador to China, Max Backus, for a dressing down. And they've also called these allegations extremely absurd. In recent months, China has undertaken destabilizing unilateral actions asserting its claims in the South China Sea. We take no position on competing territorial claims. But we firmly oppose any nation's use of intimidation, coercion, or the threat of force to assert those claims. The United States will not look the other way when fundamental principles of the international order are being challenged. Beijing quickly reacted to the accusations and denounced Hegel for singling out China at a public venue. The Chinese official also said the speech was completely non-constructive and full of hegemony, threats and intimidation. The Treasury is once again criticizing China for failing to let its currency appreciate against the dollar and for the rapid buildup in China's foreign exchange reserves, saying in this report, quote, both the rigidity of the renminbi, another name for the yuan, of course, and the reacceleration of reserve accumulation are serious concerns which should be corrected to help ensure a stronger, more balanced global economy. Tomorrow, there will be a formal announcement that Australian dollars can be directly traded into renminbi, into the Chinese currency RMB here in China, the third currency in the world to do so after the US dollar and the Japanese yen. This is another small step in China's campaign to increase international use of its currency. China has launched other new currency pairs in recent years, including the Canadian dollar, Malaysian ringgit and Hong Kong dollar. The deal is meant to help promote business between the two countries by allowing trade without using the U.S. dollar as an intermediary. A U.S. Navy patrol aircraft was stalked and then repeatedly buzzed by a Chinese fighter jet in international airspace this week. Pentagon officials are calling it dangerous and unprofessional. The U.S. and Japan issued strong statements of concern over the issue, and on Tuesday, the United States confirmed that it flew two B-52 bombers over China's newly established air defense zone, as well as the disputed Diaoyu Islands. U.S. State Department spokesperson Jen Psaki on Tuesday expressed U.S. concern over the issue when asked about whether the United States' action should be viewed as counter-provocation. Psaki refused to comment. This phenomenon, as I say, is fairly self-evident, even if you are only looking at the headlines of today's news. But if you are only looking at the headlines, then you might have missed a very different set of data, indicating a very different and perhaps directly contradictory narrative, one that paints China and its supposed foes in the West not as allies pitted against each other, but as 
partners, however uneasily, in some sort of alliance that will set the tone for the 21st century. Uh, Evelyn de Rothschild joins us now to talk about investing in China and his latest venture, Weather Central, here as well. So, Evelyn, thank you very much indeed for joining us. I just uh, want to get your views on how things have evolved. Has it become a more open society? Has it become an easier place to do business? Oh, I think there's no doubt. I think it's a remarkable country. When you think of what has happened in the last 10 years, let alone 20 years, is, is an achievement beyond recognition. I'm Richard Rockefeller. I'm chair of the board of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. The sentiments that my grandfather and grandmother and actually other relatives of that generation had for China, very positive feelings for the country, passed through the generations to all of us. So China, in a way, wasn't such an unfamiliar place to us as it might have felt for a lot of Americans. What sort of a financial deal should Obama be seeking to strike when he travels to China next month? No, I think this would be the time because you really need to bring China into the creation of a new uh, um, uh, uh, world order, financial world order. Sir Evelyn, what about the RMB situation? You mentioned a, a so-called currency problem. I mean, do you see the day in the next five years where it's fully convertible and flexible? Well, <laughs> you're talking to a person who's quite old. Uh, if I'm around in five years, I'd like to think that that is the case. Uh, I think we've all got to move towards that opportunity, and I think the challenge also is whether we should move towards an international currency. But they really are issues of the construction of a new world order. That's what this is about. And that's the sort of dialogue the Chinese are generally good at. And as and so a partnership between us is essential. A conflict between us is going to exhaust us both in tactical exercises that cannot be conclusive. And the New World Order could satisfy both? It has to satisfy both because otherwise it will lead to tensions that will exhaust us both. One has to give credit to President Nixon's and Henry Kissinger's initiative they broke the ice, and they did. But they confronted a residue of suspicion, and that suspicion was mutual, and grievances, and they were also mutual, that it really took time for the relationship to sort of become more normal, more predictable, and eventually what we accomplished was that it became, in fact, open and full, comprehensive and in fact initiated a kind of secret uh, collaboration or even perhaps you could call it an alliance. And so we have on one hand the fiery and bellicose rhetoric of the would-be belligerents of the Cold War of the 21st century and on the other hand the conciliatory or even cooperative pronouncements of the usual gaggle of super gophers, the super class identified by uh, Henry Kissinger protege David Rothkopf in his recent book of the same name that identified about 6,000 global actors able to implement transnational policy agendas thanks to their political and financial influence. Are these two positions which seem to go head on and seem to be completely irre irreconcilable, in fact resolvable, if we look at this not as a two-dimensional surface level conflict taking place between na nation states or groupings of nation states on the geopolitical chessboard, but in fact a three-dimensional problem that involves hierarchies of control vying in different levels of this game for different um, squares, not just squares of a chessboard, but a 3D chessboard if we can extend the metaphor. Well, in fact, that is exactly the position I would take. And as strange as that might seem, as, it, as, as difficult as it might be to wrap our heads around that type of conflict, which is happening at one level, which is actually cooperation at another level, it should be noted that this is not the first time in history that we've noticed this type of phenomenon. And in fact, even within the past century, we noticed very, very similar uh, analogous, one would almost say template or prototypical examples of this very phenomenon, as identified by a researcher who I have name-checked 
a number of times on this podcast in the past, so I certainly hope my regular listeners will be familiar with his work already. I am referring, of course, to Anthony C. Sudden, the author of such trade books as Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, Wall Street and FDR, uh, but also uh, the author of many scholarly publications, academic publications that were published under the auspices of the Hoover Institute in the 1970s and that have been well, uh, well-regarded scholarly works that were even name-checked by the likes of Zbigniew New Brzezinski as being uh, con- con- uh, convincing proof of their the, the thesis that these books were forwarding. And that thesis revolved around the idea that in the case of, for example, the Bolshevik Revolution or the rise of the Nazis, that it was the Western powers, specifically the financial center of Wall Street and the Wall Street bankers, who were helping to fund their supposed arch enemies, the socialists of various stripes, whether that be the Bolsheviks or the National Socialists in Germany, for their own agenda purposes. Dr. Sutton, you wrote three series of books while you were a research fellow at the Hoover Institute. Can you give me basically the background of the content of these series? Yes, the, uh, the uh, series I wrote at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University concerned the transfers of Western technology to the Soviet Union and essentially comprised uh, three individual books. Each book covers a period of time from, since 1917. And then you wrote a second series of books on Wall Street. Yes, uh, these were trade books. Uh, In other words, they're they're not academic books. They're written for the general public. Uh, They concerned the uh, build-up of the three types of socialism, uh, Bolshevik socialism in Russia, um, what we might call welfare socialism in the United States, and uh, Hitlerian or national socialism. And each book examines the financing and the contributions made by Wall Street by international bankers to that to the development of that specific form of socialism. But the obvious question here is why? Why on earth would these crony capitalists be funding their erstwhile supposed nominal arch nemesis rival enemies, their sworn enemies, the socialists? These are directly contradictory ideologies and viewpoints and economic uh, systems. Why on earth would the capitalists be supporting the socialists in various countries? This seems completely nonsensical if we look at it from that, again, two-dimensional surface-level reality. But if we extend this out again to the three-dimensional hierarchical reality, we start to realize that there are agendas that can be served by the crony capitalists supporting command and control economical structures and political authoritarian structures in various countries. Just tell us all over again why. Why? Just tell us again. You won't find this in the textbooks. Why is to bring about, I suspect, a plan to control world society in which you and I won't find the freedoms to believe and think and do as we believe. Did these uh, power brokers actually envision at that time a one world government that would be socialist? Yes. The second statement I made was that they did not want the Soviet Union to develop into another free enterprise society and that this would offset, offset it revolution would offset this event. That was made as a statement in 1919. You have various books, one by Gillette, the razor blade Gillette, uh, the, uh, called The City, I think it was, which laid out this corporate socialism for the world to see as early as, what, 1905, 1910. So around the turn of the century, you begin to see actually written statements by these internationalist businessmen of the kind of socialist empire they wanted to bring about. It's there, but these books, of course, are not included in your courses in political science and history at the regular universities. And so we're beginning to develop a thesis that I like to think of as a revision or updating or extending of the thesis of Anthony Sutton into the 21st century U.S. versus China paradigm, which, again, looks, I think, very similar in some ways to the U.S. versus Russia, the U.S. versus Nazi Germany paradigm of the 20th century. And I say it's a revision and updating and extending of those of that thesis because I would posit that the 
the the the form of the thesis that this takes when we apply it towards the supposed battle between the American capitalists and the Chinese communists is in fact the agenda to forward the development of a system of one world governmental control that involves the merger of capitalist and socialist systems into a system that basically contains the worst of both worlds. We have the Chinese version of red capitalism, which represents both the command and control top-down political authoritarianism and the bankster-controlled economic crony capitalism that is the model for the new world order. But do we have any evidence for this thesis. This, of course, is the meat and potatoes of what we're talking about today, because uh, for anyone who has not done any research into Anthony Sutton's works or read any of his books, I would like to assure you that these interview clips that we've been looking at, um, it's hitherto, or that you may have seen or heard online before, are really just the summation of the years and years of extensive study that Sutton did into the State Department archives and the personal correspondence of various people involved, the uh, pouring over of receipts and, uh, and economic um, data from various corporations, and uh, all of that hard legwork that Sutton did for years and years developed into academic scholarly books that eventually became trade books, and we are now looking at the interviews that he did trying to summarize all of that research. The actual data in that research was pretty phenomenal and phenomenally and convincingly put together by Sutton over a very long period of time. So no matter what this thesis sounds like or whether it makes sense or it doesn't make sense is irrelevant. It really is the data that we have to look at. So let's start putting some of those pieces on this chessboard and see if it makes sense as the new great game. So let's start with the idea, for example, when uh, when Sutton was talking about the rise of the Bolsheviks, the rise of the Nazis, he was talking about the various ways in which these movements were funded and supported and aided and and basically built into the position that they could become the dominant forces in those societies. And do we have a parallel with the communist Chinese, obviously taking over the country in 1949 and being bitterly opposed by the Kuomintang uh, of uh, Chiang Kai-shek, who of course then retreated to Taiwan and the battle lines were then drawn, uh, with China of course claiming Taiwan as part of its, uh, its natural one China territory, and of course Taiwan declaring itself to be an independent republic. And so things stand, and that's of course the very uneasy position that we remain in today, and the idea being that if China ever went and tried to militarily take Taiwan, then World War III is on, or something along those lines. So it, from the perspective of that narrative, the U.S. was obviously supporters of Chiang Kai-shek and the, and the uh, Kuomintang. It was quite obvious that this was the case. At least that's the surface-level reality. Is there convincing or, or in interesting or definitive or persuasive or whatever kind of evidence to point to the contrary, that in fact this, the U.S. In, or not necessarily the government, but influential people in this super gopher, super class category were actually helping to support Mao and the communists. And there is actually some tantalizing clues along that path. I don't think I've found anything that I would call definitive. I've heard claims, for example, of CIA, uh, of station chiefs having claimed that the CIA was covertly supporting Mao. I haven't actually seen any of those claims, though. I've heard them talked about, but I haven't actually tracked down the claims themselves. If anyone can help me with that, that would be much appreciated. But we'll talk more about how you can help out with this overall investigation into China and the New World Order at the end of this episode. But let's take a look at just some of the, the crumbs on this cookie trail that I did find uh, in, this, in the research for this podcast episode. And we'll start with an edition of the Yale Daily News, specifically number 96 from Facebook. February 29th, 1972, that is available for reading online on the Yale Library, Digital Library. And it, it, it contains a front page story, a very interesting one called uh, Yale Group Spurs Mao's Emergence. And it, st it, start it, states, <laughs> it states, William F. Buckley was not the only Yale figure connected with the presidential trip to China, of course, referring to the then recent trip to China of President Nixon. Without Yale support, Mao Zedong may have never risen from obscurity to command China. Jonathan Spence, professor of Chinese history, was the first to discover Mao Zedong's connection with Yale. 
The professor noted, in 1919, Mao, age 26, was in Changsha, having finished his middle school education. He visited Peking and while there received his serious introduction to communist theory in Li Ta Chao's Marxist study group. Now, if he was to develop a reputation in socialist circles, he had to find a forum to propagate his views. At this crucial point, the student union of Yale and China invited Mao to take over the editorship of their journal. Mao accepted the position and changed the format of the student magazine. It would now deal with social criticism and current problems and focus on thought reorientation. Thought reorientation. That is a very intriguing name for brainwashing or... <laughs> or uh, reprogramming, or whatever we want to call it. But again, a very tantalizing piece of the puzzle, and one that has been, there has been a certain amount of hay made from this. There was a Yale in China connection to Mao. And Yale, of course, the home of Skull and Bones. So there is the specter of Skull and Bones over this relationship. And that, again, has there has been some, uh, some hay made of that connection. For example, perhaps most notably, in an oft-cited article from the 19, January 26, 1990 edition of the New Federalist call, called Bush's China Policy, Skull and Bones. And this article reads, quote, George Bush, the first U.S. diplomatic representative to the People's Republic of China back in 1973, was a member of Skull and Bones. So were his father, brother, son, uncle, nephew, and several cousins. Winston Lord, the Reagan-Bush administration ambassador to China, was a member. So were his father and several other relatives. James Lilly, the current ambassador to China, was a member of Skull and Bones, as was his brother. Except during the Carter administration, every U.S. ambassador to Beijing since Kissinger's deal with Mao Zedong was a, was a member of the same tiny Yale cult. A mere coincidence? Mao was a Yalee. Back in 1903, Yale Divinity School established a number of schools and hospitals throughout China that were collectively known as Yale in China. It has since been shown that Yale in China was an intelligence network whose purpose was to destroy the Republican movement of Sun Yat-sen on behalf of the Anglo-American establishment. The Anglo-American establishment hated Sun because he wanted to develop China. On the other hand, they loved the Chinese communists because they intended to keep China backward and were committed to growing dope. One of Yale and China's most important students was Mao Zedong. Okay, we'll end that article there. There's a little bit more that you can continue reading and uh, that gets into, for example, Anthony Sutton's work. But uh, uh, again, a fascinating piece of this puzzle. But we should note, for example, this article in The New Federalist claims that Mao was an actual student of Yale and China. Although the Yale Daily News claimed that he was not a student, he was just invited for some random reason to edit uh, the Yale in China uh, uh, journal, and for whatever reason, took over and started his thought, reorienta or thought reorientation program that ultimately developed into the communist Chinese movement. So, again, a very, very interesting connection, and especially interesting to contemplate the connection of all of those various ambassadors to China, which, again, up to the point of 1990, every single ambassador except under Carter had been a uh, Skull and Bones member. So that's, I mean, obviously, that's a very interesting connection in and of itself but not necessarily definitive of anything. I still think there's probably more that needs to be made uh, in, in a concrete sense in that connection, but obviously a lot to ponder there. And of course, that does go back to the early, the, the, the founding of Skull and Bones and the earliest uh, uh, part of it, which of course was the, the money from the, the opium trade that the, uh, the Russell Trust um, was, was the, uh, the, 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 the holder of. And of course, that family going on to be one of the founders of Skull and Bones. So again, a lot of interesting history there, but as I say, nothing that definitively shows how Yale and Skull and Bones created the communist Chinese, but there is enough of a connection that I think more research needs to be done in that vein. However, we can tell um, from going forward from the time when Mao took over the country and began his absolutely horrific abominable great leap forward that resulted in the death of at least 40 million people in the starvation of that it, that occurred in that four year window 40 million people starving to death during the great leap forward it is really interesting and well i suppose disgusting to note the cover that he received from some very important Western politicians, perhaps unsurprisingly, with one of the most notable examples being French President François Mitterrand, who, of course, covered for, uh, for Mao during 
one of his visits to China. We can pick this up from the New Statesman, which had a uh, article, Mao's Great Famine, the History of China's Most Devastating Catastrophe, 1958 to 1962 which starts by saying, when Francois Mitterrand visited China in 1961, Mao Zedong mocked reports of famine in the country. There was no famine, he said, only a period of scarcity, an assertion that Mitterrand, who described Mao as a great scholar known in the entire world for the diversity of his genius, was happy to accept. Returning to France after his three-week tour, Mitterrand had no doubts about his account of events. I repeat, in order to be clearly understood, there is no famine in China. Western politicians of the right shared the French socialist leader's view. After touring China in late 1960, the conservative MP for Chester, John Temple, reported that communism was working and that the country was making great progress. And as disgusting as that was, of course, another very famous or what should be very infamous example of a influential Western figure backing that disgusting display that we saw under the reign of Mao was, of course, the 1973 New York Times editorial by none other than David Rockefeller under the title From a China Traveler, in which I think he infamously said, the social experiment in China under Chairman Mao's leadership is one of the most important and successful in human history. Again, uh, comparing that type of rhetoric to the actual actions of Mao and what was accomplished under his leadership is, well, quite the disparity. And one might ask why that would take place. But I would like to draw people's attention to a different part of that editorial, one that is much less cited, in which Rockefeller writes, The Chinese, for their part, are faced with altering a primarily inward focus that they have pursued for a quarter century under their current leadership. We, for our part, are faced with the realization that we have largely ignored a country with one-fourth of the world's population. When one considers the profound differences in our cultural heritages and our social and economic systems, this is certain to be a long task, with much accommodation necessary on both sides. Very interesting passage, not least of which because one might well ponder who is exactly meant in that we and our. Is that America as a whole, or does that have more to do with Rockefeller, his obvious banking and oil interests, his other ties to the financial and and, uh, oligarchical elite? I, I think the latter more so than the former. But regardless, I think that this is actually... The in a, in a couched sense, the, a reformulation of our thesis that ultimately the plan, the long-term game plan, has been at least since the time of the 1970s and the opening up of China, the very idea of merging China's inward focus and its top-down control with the ideas uh, that the, uh, the the West was seeking to import in terms of uh, economic, social, historical systems. Very interesting. So. How, did, how was this actually accomplished? Again, it's one thing to talk about it in generals. How about in specifics? Well, of course, we're talking about David Rockefeller and his 1973 uh, speech or, or op- op-ed in favor of the great socialist revolution of Mao. But it's interesting to note that the 1972 trip of Nixon to China beget the famous Vulcan phrase for Star Trek Six fans in the crowd, only Nixon could go to China. But actually, the phrase shouldn't be only Nixon could go to China, because Nixon was preceded in his 1972 visit to China in 1971 in a series of secret meetings that were eventually revealed of Henry Kissinger to Beijing. It was Kissinger, of course, who paved the way for Nixon to normalize relations with China. And who is Kissinger? And who does he work for? Well, again, we don't have to dig dig very deeply for this knowledge. In fact, we could turn to that bastion of truthiness, Wikipedia. If it's written there, it has to be true, right? It's certainly mainstream if it's written there. So, again, from David Rockefeller's own Wikipedia entry, quote, In Henry Kissinger, Rockefeller found a political operative with an international and domestic perspective similar to his. They first met in 1954, when Kissinger was appointed a director of a seminal Council on Foreign Relations study group on nuclear weapons, of which David was a member. The relationship developed to the point that Kissinger was invited to sit on the board of trustees of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Rockefeller consulted with Kissinger on numerous occasions, as for example in the Chase Bank's interest in Chile and the possibility of of, uh, the election of Salvador Allende in 1970, 
interestingly, and fully supported his Opening of China initiative in 1971 as it afforded banking opportunities for the Chase Bank. Oh yes, in this formulation, it was Rockefeller supporting Kissinger's initiative to open up China rather than the other way around. Yeah, sure, sure, Wikipedia. I, uh, I believe that one. But regardless of the relationship, Kissinger, Rockefeller, two peas in a pod, with the same agenda to open up China uh, from the Mao era of Great Leap Forward and then the Cultural Revolution, which was an interesting time in which Mao did a very astute political maneuver. Let's not say that he was a stupid man. He was a disgusting, horrible, cruel perverse person, probably the greatest mass murderer in the history of the world, but he was not necessarily a stupid man, and one does not retain control over a country for that long in those types of revolutionary situations without some political, uh, politically astute moves. And the Cultural Revolution, in some ways, although this needs a large degree of fleshing out, but can be seen as a type of counter-revolution instituted by Mao against the counter-revolutionary tendencies that were taking place within his own party. Uh, again, it was an interesting maneuver to get the people against the Chinese uh, Communist Party, which was turning against Mao so that he could retain his power. An interesting setup, but at any rate, the Cultural Revolution was the uh, was what uh, occurred after the Great Leap, the utter disgusting, horrific failure of the Great Leap Forward, which managed to maintain Mao's control over the country. And then... After that point, at the point where the handover took place and uh, Mao was out of power, we started to see a new generation of Chinese leadership taking over. And this is where the story gets extremely interesting and connects again with these same figures of Chase Manhattan, of Rockefeller, Kissinger, all of these figures come together at a very interesting point. And we'll take this from a 1986 work by Michel Chosodovsky, Towards Capitalist Restoration, where he writes, quote, The 1979 visit of Deng Xiaoping to the U.S. was followed in June 1980 by the equally significant encounter in Wall Street of Rong Yiring, chairman of Siddiq, and David Rockefeller. The meeting held in the penthouse of the, China, of the Chase Manhattan Bank comp complex, was attended by senior executives of close to 300 major U.S. corporations. A major agreement was reached between Chase, Citic, and the Bank of China involving the exchange of specialists and technical personnel to identify and define those areas of the Chinese economy most susceptible to American technology and capital infusion." End quote extremely interesting. Well, now we have a very solid lead, a very specific point on which to start building our case. And this is, again, the confluence of this Rong Yiren, which I'm probably mispronouncing. And let me just, of course, add the caveat to any Chinese speakers in the crowd that I apologize for butchering your language and every single name in this uh, episode of the podcast. Rong Yiren, the chairman of Citic, which is obviously something that deserves uh, more scrutiny, with David Rockefeller, the Chase Manhattan Bank, 300 major U.S. corporations meeting and, uh, and engaging in a large uh, agreement on technical and specialist uh, exchange of information and personnel to identify and define those areas of the Chinese economy most susceptible to American technology and capital infusion. So who is Yurong Yiren? Who, what, what, what was Siddiq? What, 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 where did this come from? How does this relate to the, the, the presidency of Deng Xiaoping? Well, let's start boiling this down in a fascinating little piece of this puzzle that was provided by Bloomberg a couple of years ago. Of course, this is not exactly hidden knowledge that was never known before this Bloomberg report, but it was interestingly summarized in a December 27th, 2012 Bloomberg report. Heirs of Mao's uh, comrades rise as new capitalist nobility. Uh, this is a fascinating story about what was a group that was known as the Eight Immortals. And yes, I am not making that up. They're known as the Immortals. And this is a group, a uh, new class of, of people who have arisen um, that were connected to eight people specifically who survived the Cultural Revolution of Mao and were in high-ranking positions in the Chinese Communist Party to start implementing a, a very different agenda from Mao's agenda in the reign of Deng Xiaoping. So, picking up from that article, quote, The people generally known as the Eight Immortals are now all dead, though all but three lived into their 90s. Their stature in China is on a par with that of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson in the U.S. They are Deng Xiaoping, 
General Wang, who fed Mao's troops, Chen Yun, who took charge of the economy when Mao assumed power in 1949, Li Xianyan, who was instrumental in the plot that ended the Cultural Revolution, Peng Zheng, who helped build China's legal system in the 1980s, Song Rengchong, the party personnel chief who oversaw the rehabilitation of purged cadres after the Cultural Revolution, President Yang, who backed Deng's order to carry out the 1989 Tiananmen Square ca crackdown, and Bo Yibo, a former vice premier and the last of the immortals to die at 98 in 2007. Or in the Chinese pronunciation of these names, Deng Xiaoping, Bo Yibo, Chen Yun, Song Renqiong, Peng Zhen, Wang Zhen, Li Xianyan, Yang Shangkun and others. Continuing with the Bloomberg article, they emerged from the Cultural Revolution after Mao's death in 1976, during which many of them had been in internal exile to find an economy in ruins. Gross domestic product in 1978 was $165 a person, compared with $22,462 in the US. With Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong booming, the immortals were surrounded by capitalist success stories. The victorious communists had executed landlords after 1949, farms had become people's communes, factories belonged to the state. The immortals turned that on its head in the 1980s. Farmers could lease land. Private enterprise, at first on a small scale, later bigger, was tolerated, then encouraged. Deng took the gamble that in order to stro stoke growth, some flies and mosquitoes could be tolerated, said Ed Ezra Vogel, an emeritus professor at Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who wrote a 2011 biography of Deng. All right, so there you go. There is, in a nutshell, the Eight Immortals and their progeny, which now are still uh, in control of so many different facets of the state-controlled economy uh, there in China that it is extremely interesting. The uh, not strictly state-controlled anymore, the now private enterprise slash state control hybrid system that China is prototyping for the New World Order system. And it's interesting, I mean, it's fascinating to look at these eight families and the way that their connections uh, continue to, uh, to wield inordinate amounts of power over the political and economic life of China. And there's more on that in this story in Bloomberg and other stories that have been published in Bloomberg and in various pieces of this puzzle that will be found in a million different places, which I'm going to ask your help for in helping to connect some of those pieces later on in this episode. But let's continue on and picking up that thread from the eight immortals and their their influence back to what we were talking about earlier with that secret meeting in uh, 1980 with Chase Manhattan and Rockefeller meeting with Yong Ren, Yi Ren of the Siddic group. Well, that ties into this story of the immortals, reading again from that Bloomberg article. Uh, within months, Wang Jun, the general son, that's General Wang, one of the eight uh, immortals, was made head of business operations at the newly formed Siddic known then as China International Trust and Investment Corporation. The group, founded by Rong Yi Ren, was set up to attract overseas investment at a time when the country's foreign exchange reserves were $840 million. He turned it into a sprawling empire to drive China's growth. Siddiq now runs China's biggest listed securities firm, backs a Beijing soccer team, and develops luxury real estate projects. China's reserves today stand at $3.3 trillion. 840 million to 3.3 trillion. So that gives you a sense of what Siddiq is and how it relates to the current Chinese hierarchy. But let's uh, let's focus even more uh, closely in on that Rong Yi Ren character who in June 1980 was meeting with Rockefeller at the top of Chase Manhattan Complex in Manhattan. Uh, we can find this from an obituary to Rong Yi Ren that was, uh, that was run in uh, the time of his death. So this obituary, entitled The Death of China's Red Capitalist and the 1949 Revolution, reads in part, quote, In Siddiq's first year of operations, Rong met with 4,000 foreign businessmen. He also enlisted da, 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 Henry Kissinger, the former U.S. Secretary of State who established diplomatic relations with Beijing in 1971 as one of the company's main international advisors. Rong facilitated investment by building infrastructure in the free trade zones and helping foreign firms set up operations. Philip Wong, a Hong Kong delegate to China's National People's Congress, told the China Daily on October 28th, if not for his, Rong's, ability and vision in setting up CITIC, the pace of economic development in China would not have been so fast. 
By 1992, Ronk City had become a business empire involved in shipping, power generation, and construction. Today, Citic has 200 enterprises around the world and total assets of 6.3 billion US dollars. Again, that was 2005. As Citic developed, so did Rong's private businesses. In 1979, he sent his son, Larry Rong, to Hong Kong to manage his investments there. In 2005, Larry Rong was named by Forbes magazine as China's richest man with a fortune of 1.64 billion dollars. Billion with a B. Rong Sr. also played a key role in the further opening up of the Chinese economy after the suppression of the anti-government protests in May and June of 1989. Deng Xiaoping justified the massacre of workers and students in Tiananmen Square on the grounds that it was necessary to defend the socialist system. In reality, it was aimed at crushing the opposition of the working class to the impact of the regime's free market policies. Free market, yes. An interesting little bit of propaganda snuck in there. In 1993, Rong was promoted to vice president of China as a symbol of Beijing's determination to accelerate market reform. As the obituary to Rong in the British Financial Times noted, the post was mainly ceremonial, but it sent a clear message. China's new blend of communist politics and market economics was here to stay, and it was the red capitalist who had shown the way. The same year, China received $111 billion of contracted foreign direct investment, nearly four times the amount that had been invested in the entire 10-year period from 1979 to 1989. End quote. Very interesting character, and you will notice the little bits of propaganda and the little bits of the narrative that are already being inserted into this in very very subtle but very powerful ways. For example, it's the free trade, it's the the capitalist aspects of this this uh, CIDIC and these types of organizations that are to blame for the uh, the the incredible uh, uh, oppression and political oppression that we saw at Tiananmen Square and that we've seen in various other contexts uh, from Beijing. Uh, that's that's somehow to do with the the free market system with capitalism because of course when we're talking about these eight immortals and their progeny controlling hundreds of billions trillions of dollars ultimately if we include the Chinese reserves in all of these various corporations, these state-controlled corporations. This is somehow free market. This is somehow the uh, the example of, of capitalism. So you'll see the way that certain pieces of the narrative are inserted here to try to uh, to, to create false paradigms that are again at that two-dimensional stage. It's capitalism versus socialism, and they butt heads and and oh look what results. Um, and there are other aspects of this that I think are worth highlighting. For example, when Heinz Kissinger himself poses something that I think is also becoming another idea that is pushed in this China versus the U.S. narrative, which is that, well, you know, when you think about it, militarily, em em from the perspective of empire, the Chinese are kind of the good guys. Uh the Chinese believe in the superiority of their culture, the uniqueness of their culture, and they are de delighted and proud if you respect it, but there's no way you can become a Chinese. Uh, it is not a, if you are not part of the Chinese culture and born into the Chinese culture, uh, you cannot become one. So uh, it's hard to imagine Chinese armies intervening somewhere to make Chinese culture the gov or t Chinese governing principles, that is not a Chinese way of thinking. The Chinese way of thinking is that the majesty of the Chinese conduct and the achievements of Chinese society will inspire respect which leads to a cooperative action. But it's not one that they have historically attempted to bring about by military force. They'll use military force if they feel themselves threatened and ruthlessly. Uh, but it's hard for me to visualize a Chinese military strategy designed to back up a Chinese world government, uh, even in the name of universal peace, 
And so here's the narrative that becomes kind of the the counter narrative to the the mainstream narrative, which is propagated in the West, which of course is that the U.S. and NATO are the good guys in this Cold War scenario. Well, of course there has to be a counter narrative, an alternative narrative that is subtly injected into the conversation by people like Kissinger, who have been intimately involved with the creation of the, this red capitalist system since its inception, as we've already detailed in various ways, in which we will continue to detail. But uh, he gets to insert certain things that become part of the counter-narrative as well, like, oh, well, China, they don't go out and militarily invade other countries. They're the good side of the, the New World Order. And uh, so I think that's another thing that we and the alternative media really have to be careful about, is what counter-narratives are we propagating? And are they truly counter to the system that is being established? Are they truly counter to the mega-billionaire financial elite uh, interests that are puppeteering? tearing this butting of heads of the capitalist and socialist system. Well, let's let's continue. What specifically resulted from these increasing ties through organizations like CIDIC, which very attentive listeners of this podcast will remember from our examination of the uh, the Power Corporation and the Demarais family in Canada, which uh, managed to get uh, an interest in and ultimately sat on the board of CIDIC Pacific, which was uh, a Hong Kong subsidiary of CIDIC, which is the same CIDIC which was Rong Yi Ren working with Rockefeller and everyone at Chase Manhattan and the 300 U.S. corporations to establish this U.S.-China tie. Uh, so again, the, the layers are so deep. There are so many different facets to this story, but they interlock and they are fascinating when you start going down this rabbit hole. But let's take a look at some more specific examples of what actually eventuated from this. And in order to do that, um, we can look, for example, at even what is bragged about openly by the uh, uh, Beijing government itself, um, literally the government of Beijing specifically, which has a uh, post on their website, ebeijing.gov.cn, Fortune 500 Investment in Beijing CBD. Drivers of foreign investment in China and the new R&D models. As can be... Oh, sorry. I'm reading from the wrong... I'm reading from the wrong document. Well, I have so many documents that I can't keep track of them all. And that should be a little reminder, and I should take a moment to once again state, of course, the show notes for this episode are available at CorbettReport.com. Copious show notes with links to all of the documents that we're talking about so that you can start to uh, piece some of the, the pieces of this very interesting puzzle together for yourself. But let's turn to, again, this Fortune 500 uh, in, important engine driving Beijing CBD economic development on the Beijing government government website, which uh, notes that there uh, has been an exceptional increase in Fortune 500 investment in China over the past uh, decades. And then in the 1990s, we have the Fortune 500, 500 enterprises setting up investment companies in Beijing, and it goes through the history of that. And then in, after 2000, they set up regional headquarters in Beijing. So you're getting the idea. We have the gradual buildup of the financial, the economic, the productive, even the investment capacity of foreign Fortune 500, which we should read as the corporate member roster of the Council on Foreign Relations, for example, that's all interlocking, uh, is is growing steadily throughout the 19. 19- 70s, uh, the opening up, the 1980s, the 1990s, and then the 2000 to present region. So we, of course, are looking at China generally from 2000 on with its remarkable uh, 10-15% GDP growth rate, uh, just its blistering pace of economic growth over the past decade, and as if that sprang out of nowhere and was not the concerted and and deliberate uh, product of a very uh, regimented agenda that has been at work for decades now and that has been rigorously planned out from behind the scenes uh, but be by the crony capitalists and the immortals in China and their and their progeny so uh, again, there's an interesting little graph that shows some of the examples. Um, for example, um, just charting the, uh, the 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 progress of Fortune various Fortune 500 enterprises at the beginning of the opening up in the 1970s. HP and Matsushita uh, set up offices in 1979 in the neighborhood of the Beijing Embassy. 
Uh, HB China Limited was established in, in Beijing in 1985, and Beijing Matsushita Color CRT Company Limited was established in 87. HP China Investment Company was established in 1995, and Matsushita China Limited in 1994. HP bought HP Building in, in Beijing uh, CBD in 1998 and moved several branches to the building. In 2002, Matsushita Limited was transferred to a regional headquarters. So, Again, we get the sense there is this buildup, and there's just a couple of examples of some of the companies that are involved in this, but there are many, many, many more, as detailed in an article that I wrote earlier this year and that's available on CorbettReport.com. Of course, again, the link in the show notes to an article I wrote called The Great Decoupling, How the West is Engineering Its Own Downfall. Again, more about this idea of this sort of phony Cold War and how it's being used for political purposes to engineer a new world order, a one world system which notes, quote, the Chinese industrial juggernaut did not just spring up overnight. The infrastructure for China's economic marvel of the last decade was laid in the decade before. In the seven years from 1994 to 2001 alone, direct investment of U.S.-based multinational corporations in China quadrupled from $2.6 billion to $10.5 billion. In the same period, China rose from the 30th largest target of U.S. R&D investment to the 11th, on the back of a doubling of U.S. affiliates in the country. The list of companies that started major R&D activities or facilities in China in the 1990s reads like a who's who of the CFR-nested Fortune 500 set. DuPont, Ford, General Electric, General Motors, IBM, Intel, Lucent Technologies, Microsoft, Motorola, and Roman Haas all had a significant stake in China by the beginning of the 21st century. And then the economic boom suddenly springs out of nowhere, right? Um interesting part of all of this is the fact that it was, of course, framed as the offshoring of productive capacity. Of course, we're using China for their cheap labor. That's why all these companies went to China. But the part of this that doesn't make sense is the incredible boom in R&D funding that began in the 1990s and continued through the 2000s period. Why was there all this investment in R&D in China? That's different from the productive sort of menial labor, which one can understand you're going to pay basically slave labor to uh, do menial tasks like Foxconn or whatever. But why R&D specifically outsourcing that to China? And there's an interesting report that I uncovered that deals with this problem specifically. Drivers of foreign investment investment in China and the new R&D models from UTA.edu. And uh, that's a fascinating report for a lot of different ways, including the way that it tries to deal with that idea. Why are these why were these foreign companies suddenly investing in R&D in China? And it concludes, for example, as can be seen, a great deal of research has focused on China and how global companies have moved much of their production capability to that country. However, this research has overlooked the growing amount of research and development that these firms have undertaken in China. In fact, China has seen the development of new models of R&D by foreign corporations. So again, uh, this R&D investment did not spring out of nowhere. It was, again, a part of a a coordinated agenda that involved some of the largest uh, corporations on the planet. And this report also lists some of the countries that heavily invested in R&D in the 1990s. Motorola, Nokia, Siemens, IBM, Microsoft, GM, Samsung, Nortel, GE, JVC, Intel, P&G, DuPont, Ericsson, Matsushita, Mitsubishi, Lucent Bell, and AT&T, to name a few, all have R&D facilities in China. Microsoft, for instance, invested $130 million to establish its research institute and Microsoft Asian Technology Center in China. Motorola established 18 R&D centers in China by the end of 2000. This included an initial $300 million investment and 1,060 research personnel, etc., etc. Again, this economic marvel of China over the past decade did not spring out of nowhere. It is the end result of what has been happening for decades as part of agreements that were reached decades before that. So we have to understand this deeper level of what's going on to understand what's happening at the surface level. And that, I think, gives further bolstering to our argument that what's happening is not the 2D surface reality of nation states pitted against each other, but the 3D uh, hierarchical reality of the uh, super gophers at the top puppeteering a system whereby they can play nation states against each other to create a global governmental system that will ultimately be this merger of capitalism and socialism, this red capitalism, whatever they want to call it. And of course, they will not call it red capitalism. It will not be called anything like that. But we are seeing the merger of these systems in various ways. 
But again, there's uh, so much to be said here. Um, well, let's talk about another key aspect of what uh, of what Antony Sutton talked about when he was talking about the Western backing of the Bolsheviks or the Nazis. It was not just financial support. It was not just the, uh, the, the development of, of industry. It was also technology transfers. In fact, that was the specific focus of Sutton's early work at the Hoover Institute, the technological transfers that enabled the rise of the Soviet Union into an industrial superpower from its basically feudal society before the Bolsheviks took over. And, uh, and in that regard, it was Sutton's argument that without the U.S. technological transfer and technological support, the Bolsheviks couldn't have accomplished what they ultimately did. And uh, similarly, the Nazis couldn't have uh, built up their war machine without the synthetic oil that was provided under specific agreements that Standard Oil had with their German counterparts uh, to provide the technology to create the synthetic oil that fueled the, the German Nazi war machine that, again, could not have functioned without that. So... Is there technology transfer going on in China? The answer, the short answer is yes. There are technology transfers from the West to China that have enabled certain specific military capabilities that the Chinese now have. The question is how deep does this go and how many layers there are? I will provide just one layer because this is already a huge investigation and it's only going to expand in scope from here, but a fascinating one that developed in the 1990s, which was a series of stories about uh, basically the transfer of nuclear uh, technologies, technologies that helped aid uh, China's space program, its missile technologies, its nuclear technologies, including uh, the transfer of microchips and things that happened on, in the Clinton administration. So it was framed in that left-right debate uh, as if this was some sort of you know leftist agenda, as opposed to, again, the Bushes uh, supporting the Tiananmen Square massacre, the Clintons supporting with technology transfers. It's left, right, blue, red, fork, spoon. It makes no difference. The agenda is the same, and it's being forwarded by the Rockefellers and the Kissingers and people on that level, not the political puppets who are paraded in front of us as the shadows on Plato's cave wall. Let's take a look at this in more detail, this story, and we can get this from, first of all, I mean, uh, the good place to go would be the official um, uh, report, U.S. Commercial Technology Transfer to the People's Republic of China from the Bureau of Export Administration Office of Strategic Industries and Economic Security Defense Market Research Report, which is uh, a fascinating report about how this technology transfer occurred. Um, the executive summary of which reads, the phenomenal economic growth witnessed in China since Deng Xiaoping first declared China's open-door policy in 1978 has led many to predict China's certain emergence as an economic superpower in the early 21st century. Indeed, China has followed a structured path toward, global, uh, toward gradual market reform of its still largely state-owned industrial sector, which has been transfused with increasing amounts of foreign capital and technology. There have been numerous reports over the last several years, however, of U.S. companies being forced, forced, in quotation marks, in the report, to transfer technology to China in exchange for access to this enormous market. The purpose of this study is to assess the extent to which U.S. commercial technology is being, in effect, coerced from U.S. companies engaged in normal business practices and joint ventures in China in exchange for access to China's markets. The cumulative effect these transfers may have on China's efforts to modernize its economy as well as its industrial and military base is also examined. Finally, this study addresses the impact of U.S. technology transfers to China on the issues of long-term U.S. global competitiveness and broad economic and national security interests. And at the end of this report, it notes, although it is not possible to make a clear determination of the U.S. national security Im implications of commercial U.S. technology transfers to China, the continuation of the trends identified in this study could pose long-term challenges to U.S. national security interests. This study does not identify any specific Chinese military advances made as a result of U.S. commercial technology transfers, but does suggest that continued pressures on foreign high-tech firms to transfer advanced commercial technologies, if successful, could indirectly benefit China's efforts to modernize its military. This report was written in 1999. So before the Chinese economic juggernaut got underway uh, in, in, in earnest, it was already well known that these corporations, which were flocking to China to set up their 
R and D centers and to move uh, to set up corporate headquarters and all of these uh, other major investments that were taking place were being done on agreement that they, this would include technology transfers to the People's Republic of China that maybe could be used to build up China's military base. And now, lo and behold, wouldn't you know it, China is modernizing its military at an exceptionally rapid pace with aircraft carriers coming online, the latest uh, aircraft car- carrier killer missiles that they've developed. Uh, the drones technology that now is uh, fast approaching that of the United States. Uh, again, it's uh, a military juggernaut that's, that's still in the process of building up, but it is being built up. And how so? Again, this this type of report gives us a window into that process, a process that, again, could not take place without the active support of the very financial and corporate oligarchy that has been wedded to the Chinese immortals and the Chinese regime that's been in place at least since the death of Mao. Fascinating stuff, I hope you will agree. Um, some more specifics we can get on, for example, the Chinese military, uh, the missile allegations, the allegations of specific t- technology transfers regarding uh, missile technologies. There's a Washington Post series of articles from the 1990s on on this that I'll throw a link into. It's an interesting compendium of uh, dozens of reports that were compiled and filed in the 1998 time period. Uh, I have a report, China, possible military technology transfers from U.S. satellite export policy, actions and chronology from uh, au.af.mil. U.S., uh, this is an interesting one. Bush's brother has contract to help Chinese chip maker. Talking about... uh, uh, one of the Bushes, uh, I don't even remember which one without looking at the article itself, and his intimate uh, ties to a, uh, a Chinese chip maker in the brouhaha that caused for George W., who was in power at the time. Also, um, uh, yes, it was Neil Bush, who also, just a, a couple of years ago, made headlines for this. Neil Bush communist photo makes a scene on Chinese social media site Weibo, and it's uh, it's uh, Neil Bush wearing communist Chinese regalia saying, am I doing it right, basically? You know, it's all funny. It's all fun and games to these people. Um, th- th- that, again, is just a taste of the idea of what w- what we're really trying to drill down to, which is the specifics that Antony Sutton drew out in the Soviet uh, or Nazi uh, uh, paradigms. We want to construct the same case for what's happening with communist China, because, again, this is about the creation of the one world governmental system, and that cannot take place without, A, the nation state systems warring and ruining each other and, oh, please save us. Oh, luckily, there's this model, this structure that's already been put in place that can come save us of, you know, some sort of UN type structure that will function like the red capital, the red capitalists of China or something of that sort. And there, uh, this also cannot take place without the active cooperation and the, the financial, the corporate infrastructure that has been carefully laid out for decades now in agreements between people like Rong Yiren and uh, Siddiq and those types of groups with uh, such things as the US-China Business Council and other extremely fascinatingly interesting groups. Now, as you can imagine, Just sorting today's episode out into what I've presented so far has been a mind-boggling event, and I've had to leave out all sorts of different things that would have sent us in different directions. This podcast could probably be split into 10 different podcasts a series, and I suppose it will be, and that's what I'm going to call on all of you out there now to help engage in this task of following these different cookie crumb trails and going down the various rabbit holes and digging up what you can find. I'm calling on the Corbett Report members, the the community that is developing at the Corbett Report open source intelligence news community to help assemble some of these facts, get some of these names, follow some of these leads, uh, follow the careers of some of these characters and the various dealings that they've done to help flesh out this picture that we're painting here, because it is an exceptionally important one that tells a very different story of what we're being asked to believe, that there is a US-China rivalry and that there's going to be some war because they're so at each other's throats. That is taking place at the surface level, but there's a much deeper level of what's taking place in the third dimension that is much more more important in the overall game plan. Do not get caught up in choosing sides as if choosing a nation state or a NATO versus Shanghai cooperation organization or one of these phony controlled organizations is going to make a difference. At the end, it's a dialectic and it's going to smash these two seemingly opposed systems into each other and what's going to result is going to be horrific on the scale of what Chairman Mao instituted in his 
great leap forward. So it couldn't be more important than what's happening right now. And I think this is the perspective from which we have to view such things as what's going on in Hong Kong right now, where people are upset at the Beijing government. Now, there's all sorts of manipulations that happen and things that are taking place in the two-dimensional nation-state system version of NED and all of these usual players getting involved in this conflict, but this is part of the conflict that is planned. We have to see it at a deeper level and support the people against these various government and corporate manipulations that have been designed and are taking place. So. This is the level of analysis that we have to get into if we really want to understand what's taking place with China in this current day and age. And this is where I'm going to call on you for help. I have some various things that uh, just as suggested starting points. Obviously, take this any way you want. But here are some suggested starting points uh, for uh, where we need to go from here. First, we need more information on technology transfers. You could start using some of the articles that I've cited. You can look for your own. But I want more specifics about technology transfers that have taken place from the West to China that have enabled specifically Chinese military technology. I find that interesting. But also the Chinese cyber capabilities, the fact that they have the most controlled internet on the planet, which again is a very complicated thing to do and something that I don't think could have been done without the active support and collusion of technology companies, for example. So there's some starting points for the investigation. I want to find out more about the financial interlocks between specific Fortune 500 uh, corporations and the red capital lists. And in that regard, I think it will be extremely important to follow up on that Bloomberg article about the eight immortals, those eight families and their descendants and where they've gone and how they populate and, uh, and connect with other people. There's an interesting article I saw that connect so many of these different characters that it was a bit mind-boggling to even glance through that I'll include in the show notes at this precise time index so you can go and uh, find that article and uh, start sorting through some of those leads. Uh, I want to look at specific organizations like not only the WTO and IMF and other organizations that China is a part of that are clearly part of this global governmental order, but some others that are less scrutinized but I think no less important, like the U.S.-China Business Council, which changed its name to the National Council for U.S.-China Trade. It still exists today. It was set up 40 years ago. In my preliminary research for this podcast, I could find barely any information about the historical founding of this uh, group and who was actually its board members and when it was founded and who specifically um, founded it and in what way and, and all anything to do with the history of this group. I know that uh, Rockefeller has been an advisor to this group. I know Kissinger has been lauded and given awards by this group. But uh, specifically, there have been allegations that I've read that this group was founded by the likes of Rockefeller and Kissinger. I, if there is more information on that, uh, more solid leads that we can take this uh, to, that would be great. Uh, uh, how about thinking about this in terms of global monetary uh, order, which is going to come out of this merging of the systems? And in that regard, we can look at the interlock between the Bank for International Settlements, the Central Bank of Central Banks, identified by Carol Quickly as the absolute apex of the financial pyramid, and the PBOC, the People's Bank of China. And I'll throw in some links to some various articles that I think are um, interesting uh, with regards to the, uh, for example, a, 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 some sort of symposium that took place uh, recently, the People's Bank of China BIS Research Conference that I think will be interesting, as well as some comments that have been made in recent years by various uh, PBOC officials about how uh, basically what is needed is, uh, is uh, to add the yuan to the IMF currency basket for the special drawing rights, the SDR, which many people speculate is the instrument that is going to take over as the US dollar is the world reserve currency. Some interesting leads. Again, I'll throw those links in the show notes so you can follow through with that. Uh, a, a fascinating looking debate that I haven't had the chance to watch yet. Um, again, I would love to, to have the time to have watched this, but uh, we got to put this podcast up at some point. So it was a monk debate, which takes place in Canada. It's always an interesting a debate from a uh, from a propaganda perspective. You have to look through the propaganda, but it's interesting. And this debate was, will the 21st century belong to China? On the pro side, Niall Ferguson and David Daokui Lee. On the con side, Henry Kissinger and Fareed Zakaria. So a CFR, Bilderberg, globalist, super gopher um, tag team there. Uh, and they ended up winning that debate, inc inc incidentally making the argument that China will not be the power of the 21st century. Make of that what you will. 
So all of those leads, again, there are so many more that we can take. This is obviously just the first report in what will be an ongoing research investigation into this. I don't know what form it will take. More podcasts, more interviews, more articles, I'm sure will result from all of this research. But it is up to you guys out there. Please help me out in this compile the links. If you are a Corbett Report member, please sign into the website and leave your posts on this, uh, leave your comments on this post so that we can start compiling this research into into a more uh, fleshed out, uh, uh, detailed schematic of what we're talking about. Again, I hope I've placed some of these pieces on the board in a way that the picture comes into view and that you see that this is a system that's being puppeteered in a three-dimensional reality, not the 2D nation-state system fight that we're being asked to believe that it is. I will leave you on one final note, again going back to Anthony C. Sutton, who wrote in 1984 in America's Secret Establishment, by about the year 2000, communist China will be a superpower built by American technology and skill. How did Anthony C. Sutton know that? Was he clairvoyant? Was he a psychic? Could he read the future? Was he informed about history? Was he, in effect, an armchair quarterback who, like any good armchair quarterback, knows the opposing team's playbook so well that he can reliably predict their plays? At any rate, we will leave you there for today. This has been the final episode of the Corbett Report podcast before my trip to Europe. So uh, in, until December, there will be no further episodes of the Corbett Report podcast proper. There will be a film literature New World Order episode uh, around the time that I'm leaving. There will be uh, some, hopefully at least one video next week. But other than that, the website's going to be very quiet for the next couple of weeks as I really will be working very hard on my lectures and then delivering the lectures, so don't look for too much activity at CorbettReport.com, but I hope I've left you a lot to chew on in the meantime, so again, Corbett Report members, please start contributing to this open source investigation of China and the New World Order. Once again, I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, looking forward very much to talking to you again in the very near future. Thank you for your time. 十八岁那年我就写了如当生情书，一直不好意思把它交给党支部。无数次我把党的章程认真读，总觉得理党的样子。The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes the Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com support.